So if we can paint a broad picture here, what we have, it's loaded with ironies in a way. We've got the West, generally speaking, across the board, eating out the capital that's been bequeathed to it from previous generations. If you like, economically, morally, I'd say even spiritually, frankly. Uh, and we're confronted now by having uh, you know, our real leadership uh, globally, the liberal sort of democratic order headed up by the Americans, the sort of unilateral arrangement, threatened by really the rise of all sorts of other powers around the place. You know, you've got Russia, you've got Iran, you've got North Korea, you've got China. Uh, they have none of our lack of conviction about their own culture and their own objectives going forward. And here's the great irony, in many ways, one of the great threats is that communism in China, it seems to me, with China's, with Chinese characteristics, as they put it, they've embraced enough of a, of a capitalist model, the loathed capitalist model that so many in the West dislike now, even though it's made them prosperous and comfortable, um, to become very powerful. It's one of the great differences between communist China and communist Russia during the Cold War era. Where will America under Biden go? You touched on it a moment ago, but as an Australian, this is of enormous interest and potentially concern. The view here has been that he will hold the line on China. Uh, that's the media line that we're getting. Um, there's some real disquiet that he might undo some of the powerful things that Trump gets no credit for, but which were very effective in the Middle East. But where will, in your view, Victor, uh, America go under Biden uh, in terms of global leadership, for want of a better word, and the rise of China in particular? Well, he'll use platitudes that the world was stable before Trump came because of the bipartisan um, establishment, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Atlantic Alliance, all of that stuff. But the fact was what got Trump elected was it was completely unstable. And then appeasing China with the idea that they were going to respect our outreach as magnanimity rather than see it as contempt to be exploited proved to be completely fallacious. It didn't work. We know that. They said they told us that at every periodic communist uh, congress. So I, I think whether I, I'm a little bit pessimistic here, John, I don't want to depress your audience, but even if we had uh, an optimistic view of what Joe Biden wanted to do, I'm not sure at this late date he could do it. By, I mean, just look at the people around him. One of the, the a prominent congressman, Eric Swalwell, was caught in an amorous relationship with a Chinese agent while he was on the House Intelligence Committee. Uh, Hunter Biden was given a complete pass, even though in his own uh, laptop communications, it was pretty clear that he was involved with Chinese interest and siphoning money off to the Biden family, not in the millions, but approaching a billion dollars. And then when you uh, when you look at uh, members in the cabinet or members in the corporate world and their ties with China, and I'm just throwing out names here, whether it's the Disney Corporation or the L.A. Lakers or Goldman Sachs, but the, the, the key institutions of America are run by establishmentarians that if you were to say to them, wait a minute, you're an American and your economic livelihood should not uh, collide with America's patriotic interests. You're the, the inheritor of Okinawa or Bella Wood or Antietam. And a lot of people died to give you this, this, that would be considered lunatic. And so we have so many people that are compromised by China. I'm speaking as a member of the Stanford University community. Just this last year, Stanford reported that a visiting neuroscientist professor was actually not just attached to the Communist Party, but was actively working for the Chinese military. We had another uh, research project about facial rec recognition that was developed at Stanford that went in, uh, parts of it were used by co-Chinese uh, researchers to help surveil the Uyghurs. We had $65 million that was given to Stanford University that was not reported as legally required by the Department of Education that was in some ways get, uh, tainted by companies in China that were connected with the Chinese Communist Party. So it's going to be very difficult for Australia, for the United States, for the UK, for the EU to have a, a muscular, independent, autonomous attitude toward China when so many of our elites 
are compromised. And they don't, and worse yet, they don't see that they're compromised. They say it's a free market. We're just exploring profitability. We're improving, improving productivity, global harmony. When you have Bill Gates, the second or third wealthiest man in the world, say to the United States, I'm so tired of you harping on uh, China's handling of the virus. So far, it's been pretty good. Let's not go back there. When we know that they lied about the origins, the transmission of the virus, the communability that and they infected and probably polluted many people uh, ideology ideology wise in the World Health Organization. But for somebody to say that or Michael Bloomberg to say that China is not autocratic as he himself is in charge of bringing Western capital to jumpstart companies that are connected with the Chinese Communist Party. He's about the sixth wealthiest person in the United States, very influential, ran for president. So, gosh, when you have a party and, and one person is running for the two, at one point, the two contenders were Joe Biden, whose family was connected with China, and Michael Bloomberg, who had made billions in China and was making billions in China at the time. It's almost like it's Orwellian. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. One of the things that's puzzling is just what China's objectives actually are. Uh, presumably they seek uh, enormous recognition as a major power around the world. But what does that mean? You have to dominate the region if you want to be influential in the world. Uh, traditionally, their tactics that they're using now uh, would be seen as bullying and rejected by the rest of the world. But one of the problems is that in a world that's awash with debt, it's hard to say, no, you can't trade because governments are so desperate you know, to build their economies again. I think you and Australia are, in, are sort of the canary in the mine. You're in a very unique historical position to instruct the rest of us of the dangers because you went through it with Japan from 1932 to 1941 with their so-called Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere that was kind of reified in its final form in 1940-41, but and de facto had been there. Remember what the Japanese said? They went to countries in Asia and they said the West is spent. There is no Netherlands now. It's occupied by Germany. There is no such thing as France. It doesn't exist anymore. Southeast Asia is ours, the breadbasket of Asia. The Dutch East Indies and their oil is ours. And the only uh, obstacles are an appeasing Britain and Singapore, which we'll shortly deal with, and a isolationist America at Pearl Harbor, which we'll shortly deal with. But the point I'm making is they created a climate where the message was, it's very dangerous for you Asian countries and neighbors of Japan to think that you're going to get succor and help from a distant enemy that's not willing or willing or able to protect you. So I think what China has been saying to you in Australia and to South Korea and Japan, and even more so in the case of Taiwan, but also the Philippines, so your area of the belt around China, that we are destined economically to corrupt the West, which is decadent, and our military to catch up with the West. And you are in a very precarious position to think that the United States much less Europe, is going to come to your aid. And so you better make a deal with us now. Uh, you know, we're not going to humiliate you. It's just a working relationship in which we'll buy your products or your natural resources, but you're going to come under our ideological domination eventually and be happy about it because uh, history says that when an ally, whether it's uh, Czechoslovakia or ancient Plataea thinks that a distant, ally, a distant friend is going to come to their aid, it doesn't happen. So what we in the United States who knew that was happening, we were trying to reassure Japan it's good to rearm because we're, you're not the Japan of 1939. You're a democratic, sober country, and we want you to rearm. We want Australia. We want to come to your aid. We want to have a want you to be a de facto under a nuclear umbrella. If it, if it if it comes down to it, we are pledging the cities of the United States to protect Sydney and Tokyo and Seoul. That's what we've always, pretty much that was the deal. And we're gonna renew that. And that's what Trump did. But if you're a globalist or, uh, or even a naive globalist, then uh, you would say that China, we treated China badly, or we didn't, we didn't give them room to grow, or we misunderstood what they were trying to do, or they were spectacular in their recovery from the virus. I've heard all of that here. 
And it's very dangerous because the Chinese are very patient and they're insidious. And they feel that ultimately our system has only one good thing going for it, and that's free market capitalism, which they have adopted in some ways. But the, the downside is freedom and liberty and constitutional government. And they feel that they can go by that. And they even have a cynical disrespect for us because they say, they th say to themselves, oh, you talk so much about transgendered issues and gay rights and radical abortion and the oppressed and human rights, but we have a million people in a re-education camp based on their religion, the Uyghurs. We destroy the culture of Tibet. We surveil our own students, our own people. We harvest on occasion organs if we need them from people who are still alive. We do all sorts of things. Uh, we've corrupted the entire NBA. LeBron James will give a lecture to your own people about how you're not quite fair and judicious, but he won't say a thing about us because we've got him with Nike with a billion dollar contract over the lifetime of that contract. So they, they see that is con with contempt, that we really don't mean it and we can be bought off. And that's very dangerous when an enemy no longer, not just doesn't fear you, but doesn't respect you. And I think that's what we're getting to in the West. When they go back to Beijing, they say, these people are so self-righteous, they're so sanctimonious, but believe me, you write them a check and we can get what we want out of them. And the next step is that will be reified with, I think, a scarier scenario of armed force if need be. So I'm very, I'm very worried about Taiwan, to take the first example, because everybody thinks they're just going to wake up one morning and there's, you know, amphibious craft on the Taiwanese beaches. It's not going to work that way. It's going to be slowly to... Uh, curtail their airspace, their their sea space, to tell foreign powers you can't go in here without threats of losing something here, and then working within the chi the Taiwanese system, and so to present them with a fate accompli that it would be sort of as we saw in World War II with some states that that 1940 uh, France could not resist it if, even if it had wanted to. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.